to be better that way, probably. Uh, first, I would like to say, Kamsamida, <laughs> for inviting me. Now, unfortunately, I don't know very many more words than Koreans. So I'll be able to say much more than that. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be here. It's my first visit to Korea. And uh, I love Korean food and Korean language, so I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about um, elliptic curve cryptography and pairing-based cryptography, some optimizations of implementations, um, and some applications. Uh, my second talk is moved until tomorrow, and I will focus on some more kind of new applications of pairing, pairing-based cryptography tomorrow. And I apologize for the fact that I was late to the conference the plane uh, had to turn around and go back to Alaska because they said that there was a volcano erupting in Russia and spewing ash 40,000 feet in the air. <laughs> so I don't yet know if this is actually true, but this was the excuse that the airline gave us <laughs> for turning around. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to start, I'm sure uh, this will probably be review for a lot of you. In the beginning, I'd just like to go over a few quick things. Um, so public key cryptography in general, uh, there's a lot of different flavors of it, but two of the most basic um, building blocks of public key cryptography are a key exchange, where two parties can agree on a common secret using only publicly exchanged information, and signature schemes, which allows parties to authenticate themselves using only publicly available knowledge of their public key. So um, some examples are uh, of public key crypto systems are RSA based on the difficulty of factoring large integers and Diffie-Hellman and elliptic curve versions of Diffie-Hellman and the digital signature algorithm DSA and ECDSA. So um, I'll go over some of those in more detail in a second. But some of the important applications in the industry uh, that we're used to, that are in all of our daily lives now, are secure browser sessions using uh, SSL or TLS protocols, uh, signed and encrypted email uh, using S-MIME, uh, virtual private networking using IPsec, and authentication using certificates, for example, X509 certificates. So. Um, I apologize, here in this talk I'm mentioning a lot of the standards that we use in the United States to govern public key crypto cryptography. I'd be very interested in learning more about what standards you, you develop and you use here in Korea. And um, also the, um, the role of, you'll see in my talk a little bit, the role of government in, in determining our choices. And I'm sure you have, must have an analogous situation here. So uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange um, is something that can actually take place in any abstract group as long as you can have an efficient way to implement the group law. So the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is between two um, un parties who are unknown to each other, who we usually call Alice and Bob. And it takes place in some group G which is given by a generator, we can assume um, without loss of generality that it's a cyclic group generated by the element little g. So in order to exchange, key, to set up a key exchange over a, an untrustworthy channel, Alice and Bob can simply pick random secrets, a, little a and little b, and then they can send each other um, G to the A and G to the B, and that they can agree upon, oops, sorry, they can agree upon the secret G to the A, B. And the security of the system is based on the difficulty of the discrete logarithm problem, because knowing any adversary who eavesdrops on this channel will know G to the A or G to the B, but without knowing either of the secrets, it's hard for them to determine g to the a, b, or even to actually determine whether a given value is actually equal to g to the a, b, and that's called the decision Diffie-Hellman problem. So 
In order to use public key cryptography, you need to work in a group where the Diffie-Hellman problem is hard. And you know that if you do not have a group where the discrete logarithm problem is hard, then certainly the Diffie-Hellman problem won't be hard. So the discrete logarithm problem in this group is just given any value g to the a to determine little a, knowing g and g to the a. So we need to look at groups where the discrete logarithm problem is hard. And what typically happens is, is that when you go to implement such groups, the computation costs can be significantly higher than when implementing a symmetric key crypto system. So in the, in the, um, one of the examples that I gave already was RSA. Well, RSA key lengths can be very long. Uh, these days, they have to be at least 2,048 bits which means that when you have to do modular multiplies, you have to do a lot of carries. And so the, the uh, cost, the computational costs for working with long key sizes can be very large, um, and especially compared to symmetric key cryptography. This is something that you notice, for example, now this year with the new hash function competition, uh, you can see that no, almost none of the viable candidates are, are based on any kind of public key or provable secu security uh, principles, simply because this, of the speed required. They're almost all based on uh, some kind of symmetric uh, ciphers. Um, so uh, the other problem is, is that as attacks on things like factoring or discrete logarithm problem in, in FP star improve, the key lengths only get longer. So I mentioned 2048-bit uh, keys uh, going all the way up to 16,000-bit keys. And this costs not only in terms of computation time, but also in terms of the, um, the, the length of the signature or the, the amount of data that needs to be exchanged in order to set up a key exchange. And all of these things cost, if you have a relatively low power device, all of these things cost you in terms of both power and bandwidth and time for the user. So one of the things that uh, people started arguing for at least 10 years ago or so is the fact that there's um, alternate group that can be used, which is the group of points on an elliptic curve. And by using elliptic curves in cryptography, we might be able to get around some of these problems of the very long key sizes, things like that. So um, let me just give a brief overview of some of the advantages of using elliptic curves in cryptography. So it's, it's an alternative to RSA. That's what I listed on one of the first slides, that you have a Diffie-Hellman uh, key exchange you can do on the group of points on an elliptic curve. You also have a version of the digital signature algorithm called ECDSA. You have other things such as uh, encryption, EC algamal encryption on an elliptic curve. So basically any public key protocol that you can do on a, a general abstract group, you can do on an elliptic curve. So actually it was proposed, it's almost 25 years ago now, so it has been around for quite some time even though RSA is a bit older, having been proposed in 1975. Elliptic curves have been around, which is very important from the industry point of view because people don't tend to trust things that are new. So um, I think elliptic curves have got, really gotten into the mainstream now. And it's based on, on the hard mathematical problem, which is the discrete logarithm problem in a, on the group of points on an elliptic curve. So um, this is an alternative to working in the cyclic group FP star of a finite field, or FQ star in general, for Q some power of a prime. And the, so the minimum size there, whereas that's 2048 bits, you can get away with 256 bit keys for elliptic curves. So that's uh, currently deemed to be the equivalent security level as 2048 bit um, keys for it, for Diffie-Hellman and FP-STAR, or for RSA. So um, 
But an elliptic curve actually has many definitions. There's many ways you can think of it. Um, but in cryptography, we often just stick with mentioning just the, the Weierstrass form of the equation for the curve. So I've written the, uh, a short Weierstrass form here, which is valid if the characteristic of the field is not equal to two or three. You could have either a longer Weierstrass form or other, other forms. Uh, there are some new, new forms being discussed in the last year or so called the Edwards, Edwards curves or Edwards equations uh, for elliptic curves. Um, so this is by no means the only way to represent an elliptic curve, but this is fairly standard in cryptography. That given two elements, A and B, of a finite field, FQ, this Weierstrass form represents um, an elliptic curve, and the group of points on that elliptic curve is simply the ordered pairs x, comma, y satisfying this equation. Now, this is what I'll call the affine form of the equation. And then you'll also have a point at infinity, which acts as the identity for the group law. So let me show you the group law. I'm sure you've probably seen this before. But I thought I couldn't give a talk on elliptic curves without showing this, this picture. So uh, the idea here, there's a lot of nice ways to think about this, actually. From, uh, from the geometric point of view, this is just uh, taking two points, Q1 and Q2, that you want to add together. You pass a line through them and look for the third point of intersection with the curve, R1. And then you reflect over the x-axis to get minus R1. And this sum, we say the sum of these two points, Q1 plus Q2, is equal to uh, minus R1. And I'll show you in a little bit uh, in terms of the coordinates, um, the kinds of tricks we can do with, with optimizing this type of group law. But let me first just give you another interpretation of this group law, which is, it comes from the point of view of algebraic geometry. Um, so you could think of the group of points on the curve as actually being the elliptic curve being <coughs> isomorphic to what's called its Jacobian. And points on the Jacobian being represented by, uh, actually simply by points on the curve. And an another description for the Jacobian is um, divisor, degree zero divisor classes modulo principal divisors. And a principal divisor is the, basically the intersection of a function with uh, the curve. So here you have a line, this is a, uh, a line is defined by, you know, an equation for a line is a function. And we say the divisor of that function on the curve is these three points are at zeros. That's where it meets the curve. And then it will also have um, points at infinity, which will be its, its poles. So this, this line here has uh, two, only two points on it, and it meets the curve at infinity. And um, so the, another interpretation of this law is that if you think of the, uh, the Jacobian as just being formally a collection of points on the curve, then you can certainly formally add two points on the curve. So this is, uh, would be a valid representation of the sum in itself. But then you'd like to have what I would call a reduced form of that addition. So to reduce it back to the point where it's only being represented by one point on the curve, you need to find a point which is equivalent to it in the divisor class group. So you, you can work modulo principal divisors, and you can see that this should naturally be the sum of these two points, because this is supposed to sum up to 0, q1 plus q2 plus r1 is supposed to be 0 in that group because it's the divisor of a function. So q2, q1 plus q2 should be minus r1. So one of the other reasons I mention that is, is that it's nice uh, to think of the group law that way when you start looking at higher genus curves. Okay. Oops. 
Okay, so we've already mentioned the key, the shorter key lengths, um, leading to uh, computational advantages and fewer bits to store and send. And these are this is a, a, a table of key length equivalences. Um, the main one that I mentioned already is the main one to keep in mind. Uh, that if you want to use, uh, for example, for U.S. government applications, 256-bit elliptic curves is, uh, is considered the minimum. 2048-bit RSA or Diffie-Hellman keys is considered the minimum now. So this top line, this, this is old. This is basically not used anymore. I mean, it would be used in some kind of custom application if you just want to design something yourself in-house or something like that, or you have your own um, security designs. But for uh, industrial um, applications which are involve uh, US government applications, for example, that would not be sufficient. OK, so this was an, actually just a table to start demonstrating the advantages and the point is, is that because we have sub-exponential attacks on factoring, <coughs> we have sub-exponential attacks on factoring, and we do not have sub-exponential attacks on elliptic curve cryptography, it means that as your security demands go up, also the ratio of the uh, per difference in performance also goes up. So this is actually, um, just the first couple uh, examples here. At this security level, RSA 1024 bit compared to ECC 163 bit, the ratio of, um, this is actually a, kind of a decryption, an RSA decryption versus an ECC scalar multiplication. The ratio here was only 7 to 1. That is, it takes 7 times longer to do RSA. But as soon as you go up to this security level, the ratio was already 60 to 1. And the ratios become even more dramatic when you use special elliptic curves. So I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about what I mean by special elliptic curves. But special elliptic curves, already the ratio of the performance was about 250 to 1. So you can see that not only is it a really significant difference, but it's also in, it's a difference that's increasing over time and increasing very steeply. So this already five or ten years ago gave a lot of motivation for the adoption of elliptic curve cryptography, which is now pretty widespread in the industry. So there's a lot of different industry in the it's in the U.S. which have adopted elliptic curve cryptography, and like I said, I'd be very interested to find out more uh, about which co companies in Korea and what the government uh, applications in Korea are. So just to name a few of the companies, and then Microsoft, um, our group in Microsoft Research built an elliptic curve cryptography implementation, which uh, was actually initially targeted for a mobile platform back in 2000. And um, that product was cut and it was never shipped. But then it was eventually included mainstream in all of our products with the release of our operating system, Vista, several years ago. This was basically mandated by the US government. So there are a lot of different standards that govern the use of elliptic curve cryptography. These are just some of them corresponding to some of the applications that I listed in the beginning. So both IETF standards and uh, IEEE, also uh, NIST standards, National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology. And the reason this is important is that it gives us a framework for which curves to use so that different companies can all implement the same thing and be interoperable with each other. And this is the kind of thing that we're now starting the process for pairing-based cryptography. So a little bit later in my talk, we'll be talking more about pairing-based cryptography. And if you put a slide up here for standards for pairing-based cryptography, it would be empty. There would be none. So we're just kind of starting on down the road of standardizing pairing-based cryptography. So um, NIST standardized curves for elliptic curve cryptography, and they call them 
with these names P dash, B dash, K dash. These are for curves that are over prime fields, binary fields, and Koblitz curves, which are defined over F2, but considered over a large extension of F2. So these are the, um, and they have all different bit lengths, but 256 bit um, is usually kind of the minimum uh, targeted level. So the important thing to consider is that NIST has actually chosen very special primes for its elliptic curves that it has standardized the over prime fields. These, uh, they have chosen what are called generalized Mersenne primes. So generalized Mersenne, like a Mersenne prime is like two to some power, say minus one. A generalized Mersenne prime is two to some power minus, say, another power of two, plus or minus maybe another power of two, plus or minus one. So it's something with extremely low Hamming weight. So if you write down, um, here I can, I think I can remember one of them. I think that the one for, um, uh, for 256 is something like 2 to the 256 minus something like 2 to the 92. I forget the signs, but it's something like this. So they have developed extremely fast modular reduction for these primes which means that multiplication modulo these primes, so multiplication in the underlying field is extremely fast. And that makes a huge difference for your choices in what, in what coordinates you choose to implement for elliptic curves, for example, and in a lot of other things. And another thing to keep in mind is, is that for implementation choices, these things, can, uh, the speed of multiplication and inversion can vary dramatically also with the platform that you're implementing on because certain platforms will be more powerful or will have special instruction sets so it can make multiplication or inversion in that field much faster. Um, so the, the Mersenne primes have extremely fast modular reduction which leads to very fast, um, very fast modular multiplication. So um, when you go to implement, if you go back to, I. If you remember my Diffie-Hellman slide in the beginning, where I wrote that um, Alice and Bob had to exchange uh, public keys, they needed to exchange G to the A. Well, G to the A was written multiplicatively, where G was the generator of the group, of the group G. But with elliptic curves, we, write our, we usually write our group additively because we are adding points with that group law that I showed you. So on an elliptic curve, if you have a secret A, you're going to need to take a scalar multiple of a point P. Let's say P is in the group of points on the elliptic curve over some base field FP, and you need to compute AP. So the important thing is that you should not compute this in the naive way of just uh, kind of um, going at it, adding it P to itself eight times, you should write the binary exponentiation of A, and then you should compute um, you should compute A times P using the binary exponentiation. So I just wrote a simple example just to remind everyone. So if you want to take seven times P, you write the binary exponent the binary uh, representation of seven is one one one. So you actually have two choices. You can do left to right or right to left binary exponentiation. So if you just compute all the doubles of a point, p, 2p, 4p, 8p, and then you use um, the binary expansion of your number a, you can write the, the, um, the sum 7p as just the sum of those terms which appear as a 1 in the binary exponentiation. But there's another way, which is uh, using Horner's rule, which is to do kind of a nested um, collection of operations here, where you uh, first add, first double something, then add it to something, then double, then add, then double, then add. So it's the same, in this case, you're doing the same number of elliptic curve operations, two doubles and two adds, but you're doing them in a different order. In the, in the first case, you would do the two doubles and then you do the two adds. 
In the second case, you do a double and add, a double and then an add. And so why am I mentioning this? The important point is, is that um, these are called left to right or right to left binary exponentiation, but I can never remember which one is which. <laughs> one of them is left to right, one of them is right to left. <laughs> But um, there's a couple of other things that you can do which are standard um, when you're computing uh, scalar multiples for elliptic curve um, crypto systems. Um, and another thing is the, you can use the, what's called the non-adjacent form. So what, what's really nice is if you have kind of low Hamming weight for this uh, binary exponentiation, then that'll mean that you'll have to do fewer adds overall. But of course, you don't get to pick your number, uh, generally speaking. Generally, it's a random number that you need to do a scalar multiplication by. So what you can do is see there's not very many zeros that appear in this binary expansion. But you can try to use the non-adjacent form, which, which attempts to make it so that there's never two consecutive ones, and it does that by introducing um, minus ones, um, which, is, which translates in the elliptic curve form to using subtractions. So you can get a sparser expansion using subtractions. Sorry. So 7p, 7 could also be written as 1, 0, 0, minus 1. That, that could be an alternate expansion of 7. So that's just a silly example to give you an idea of what the non-adjacent form is and why it would be useful. So in this case, as you can see, you still have to do, you actually have to do three doubles now, but then only one add. And especially if you're working in a, um, a prime field where the characteristic is not equal to 2, the subtraction cost is exactly the same as an addition because the, the negative of a point x comma y is just x comma minus y. So it's uh, very easy to do subtraction. Okay, so another uh, implementation choice which I kind of alluded to, which is very important actually, is the question of whether to use affine or projective coordinates when implementing elliptic curve systems. So the equation that I gave you in the beginning was an affine equation. So um, the, the, you also have the uh, choice, you have the opportunity to change your elliptic curve into a projective form and use uh, projective coordinates. So instead of, so the affine form of the curve that I wrote down was y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, and the projective version would be something like y squared z equals x cubed plus ax z squared plus bz. And here you had points represented by x comma y, and then you had to add some kind of point at infinity, which was not included in this representation. Here you'd have points represented by x, a ratio x, y, z in projective space. So this, these are three tuples up to scalar multiplication by a non-zero scalar. So, and then you can also do weighted projective coordinates. And the advantage of using projective coordinates, I'm not going to go into the details here, but the advantage is that you can actually do a group law computation on the elliptic curve without doing any inversions in the field. And that can be very significant. So if you choose to use weighted projective coordinates, you can compute the double of a point in something like 16 multiplications in the field. So you might think, well, I don't know if that's a good idea. Well, it depends on whether um, field inversions are very expensive. So an affine doubling costs you something like um, two squarings and a multiply and an add, or sorry, and an inversion. So 
roughly speaking, you, you think, well, field inversion, if it costs you less than 13 field multiplications, you probably just rather stick with affine coordinates. But for example, and this I think caused a lot of confusion in the community for quite some time, the NIST curves, which are the most widely implemented curves because they're the basic standard, use a special prime where modular multiplication is extremely fast. And so in, that, in those fields, modular multiplication was claimed to be something like 80 times as fast as inversion which pushed the community towards using projective coordinates for quite some time. But um, for various reasons at Microsoft, we had our own reasons for wanting to implement general curves, not just the NIST curves. And in our implementation, we also had very fast uh, modular inversion procedures written by Peter Montgomery, who's best known for Montgomery Montgomery multiplication and, and um, kind of he's an expert on computer arithmetic. The ratio that we had was closer to five modular multiplies for one inversion, which meant that for the last 10 years we've, we've always used affine coordinates as opposed to projective coordinates. We probably we may have been the only ones doing that, but <laughs> made sense for us. But one of the things that has changed, it, has, it is still the case that for our mobile implementation that it makes more sense for us to use the affine coordinates. But with special instructions that have come in on the, um, the new platforms, um, the 64-bit x86, we have special instructions sets that make our modular multiply much faster. And it's more than 10 times uh, faster than an inversion, which has caused us to actually switch to projective coordinates for some platforms. OK, so I'm going to give you a couple of different optimizations. There are about, I would say there are about four key ideas in this talk. And here's one of them is coming up. So this is, a, um, I'm going to describe it in the case, in the setting of affine coordinates. But it also can be done using projective coordinates. So if you remember the, uh, what I called Horner's rule, if you um, implement left to right, or right to left, whichever it was, uh, binary exponentiation using Horner's rule, where you alternate between doubles and adds, double add, double add, then you'll end up doing a lot of operations like this in a single scalar multiplication. So a 2p plus q operation. So Iteratively, these p and q will change. There'll be different multiples of some point p that you're trying to compute a large scalar multiple of. But roughly speaking, um, like say using the non-adjacent form, just naively we expect there to be about one third of the uh, the um, digits or in the uh, binary expansion to be non-zero. So you'll, if your bit length of your scalar is n bits, like so for a 256 bit prime, you're generally multiplying by scalars that are roughly 256 bits. So you would do something like 256 doubles, and then you would do roughly a third of that. Also, you'd have to do that many more adds on the elliptic curve. So altogether, you're talking about doing something like, you know, between 80 and 90 double and add steps per scalar multiplication on an elliptic curve. So I'm, I'm only telling you this to make the point that if you can speed up this operation, then it has a pretty good impact on the total cost of the scalar multiplication on an elliptic curve. So now let me introduce some coordinates here. If you want to add the points P and Q, and we're going to assume that they're distinct and that x1 is not equal to x2. Um, P has coordinates x1, y1, q has coordinates x2, y2, and you want to compute x3, y3. You've probably, um, I heard that you we're going through the elliptic curve group law over the weekend, so perhaps you've looked at these formulas recently. Um, what you need to do is you need to compute the slope of a line that passes 
through those two uh, points. That's because you're trying to compute that third point of intersection. And so let's call that slope S. And I'm going to try to keep this notation for the whole talk, including the stuff having to do with pairings. So if you call this uh, slope S, then x3 is actually equal to S squared minus x2 minus x1. So you can see so far what you had to do was a modular division, which, which is an inversion plus a multiplication. And here you have to do a squaring. And um, here, oh, sorry, for y3 you had to do another multiplication. So that's just to compute p plus q. And now what we wanted, we wanted 2p plus q. So what, how are we going to do that? Um, we're going to add p plus q to p. So the notation we want to introduce is uh, the coordinates x4, y4, and the, the new slope r between the first and third points. And then x4 is r squared minus x1, x3. And y4 is just x1 minus x4 times r minus y1. OK, so that's, this is just a naive way to do 2p plus q. So here, let me show you a slightly better thing that you can do. I claim you can omit the computation of y3. So as you can see here, you had to compute y3 to go on to get r to get these, these formulas. So this was actually introduced in a paper with Kirsten Eisentrager and Peter Montgomery in 2003. And you can omit the, the y3 computation because it's only used in the computation of r, and r can be computed in this alternate way. So omitting the y3 computation saves you a field multiplication. So you might think, oh, well, this is a silly observation, but it's just something that sa saves you again and again in a modular or a scalar, <coughs> scalar multiplication. So both of the both formulas, the, the both ways of writing R involve a, a field division, so you don't save anything there. But the overall savings is a um, field, one field multiplication. So in fact, um, what we observed in a paper with Mathieu Sket and Marchois and Peter Montgomery is, is that this trick also extends to projective coordinates. It also extends to doing something like 3p plus q or 3p plus 2q, um, which led us to suggest the idea, which is now being looked at by a number of other people, again, of mixing uh, ternary, ternary expansion with binary expansion. So um, it's something that looks like it gives you an advantage when you just try out some examples, but it hasn't necessarily been very rigorously analyzed as to whether it's um, an advantage overall. But there is something that is a, a very big advantage that takes, takes advantage of this technique, and it's called uh, multi-exponentiation. So if you want to compute, say, k1, p1, plus k2, p2, and this is something that you can also use when doing, um, like if you have a fixed base that you can reuse in a cryptographic protocol, or uh, even in the internals of doing a scalar multiplication, you can often break it up and pre-compute some values in a table and do uh, the double and add trick that I showed you repeatedly. So it's a, really a way that you can say if this multi-exponentiation using the double and add trick can really save you a lot. OK, so um, here's just a couple of the uh, sample um, costs. So in affine coordinates, the doubling, like I said, is two squarings, one multiply, and one division. Um, and here you'll see the savings. You see the saving of one multiply in the using the 2p plus q double and add trick, you, you actually save two multiplies in the 3p or in the 3p plus q uh, trick. OK, so the, the next group that I wanted to talk about um, for, for, for um, discrete log-based cryptography is the group of points on the Jacobian of a hyperelliptic curve. Now, um, one problem is, is I don't see a clock anywhere, so I don't really know how I'm doing on time. You have 10 minutes. 
10 minutes, but uh, long way. <laughs> Better. Yeah, okay, so if I don't finish everything tonight, I can uh, keep going in the morning. <laughs> okay, so this was the, um, the thing that I mentioned before. I wanted to explain how this relates to the elliptic curve group law. So the Jacobian of a curve, uh, I'm going to take for an example here a genus 2 hyperelliptic curve. So y squared equals f of x, where f has degree 5 or 6, instead of for the elliptic curve case, where it had degree 3 or 4. Um, and in general, a hyperelliptic curve will have an affine uh, representation that looks like this. It's a double cover of a projective line. So it'll be y squared equals f of x, where f could have larger degree. But I'm just going to give you the example of genus 2, where it has degree 5 or 6. So as I mentioned before, uh, the, uh, you, you can think of the Jacobian as being degree zero divisor classes modulo uh, principal divisors. And um, if you don't know what those terms mean, it doesn't matter that much because you can actually just think about the picture. And um, in fact, I think it was shown by Mumford that the group of points on a genus G hyperelliptic curve can be represented by a collection of G points. So for genus 2, we're talking about a collection of two points. Um, and to make it degree 0, you just, uh, in the case of de um, the F having degree 5, you just subtract off 2 times the point at infinity. If f has degree 6, you actually have two points at infinity, which makes things a little bit more complicated. But um, we do have an efficient group law in this case, and it was given by Cantor's algorithm. So David Cantor gave an analog of Gauss's composition algorithm, Gauss's composition of binary quadratic forms, translated that into this setting of Jacobians of hyperelliptic curves and gave an explicit explicit algorithm. And one thing that um, I actually wrote a paper on uh, almost 10 years ago is the fact that you can see that group law as a, a geometric group law just like the elliptic curve group law. So I, I kind of like this picture, so that's why I wanted to include it in, in the talk, is that if you have now on the Jacobian of a genus 2 curve, you have collections of these are pairs of points, so P1, P2, and Q1, Q2, those are separate points on the Jacobian of the curves. So here's these two points and these two points. And what you do is, now there's four of them. There's no way you can pass a line through them. But what you can do is you can pass a cubic through them. So you, there's a cubic that you can determine, uh, let's call it H of X. And letting y equal h of x, if you substitute that back into your equation y squared equals f of x, you can see that generically you could expect potentially six points of intersection. Now that's not to say that these two points of intersection would necessarily be defined over the base field, but I drew it here so that they are defined over the base field just to show you what the picture looks like. So there's six points of intersection. Four of them are the ones that you started out with, and two of them are new. And so since the sum of all of these points is supposed to add up to zero, since it's the divisor of a function, that means that this plus this should naturally equal minus these. So you can see that it's exactly the same idea as the elliptic curve group law. OK. so. Um, now I'll come to the part of my talk where I'd like to switch over to some um, applications of elliptic curves and hyperelliptic curves in pairing-based cryptography. And I think that um, everyone who's working in this area recently will have to agree that this has truly been kind of an explosion in, in the field of academic uh, cryptography. And things are kind of developing so fast that I think, honestly, we can't keep up with them. So I think we need more researchers working in this area. And what I mean by that is, is that 
Parents have been found to be so useful in cryptography in so many ways that people are inventing new protocols and new uses and also new hard problems, supposedly hard problems, faster than anybody has the time to actually look at those problems and see whether they're hard. But not, and, and in fact, what we have at least, um, I don't know who else in the room, but I, at least uh, Dr. Chan has been working on attacking some of these hard, hard problems. But uh, I think we need much more work in this area, working on, on attacking these problems. Okay, so let me give you, try to give you a flavor of, of where pairings came from and what the, uh, what all these tremendous applications are. So, I think it would be accurate to say that one of the first appearances of pairings in cryptography was actually in the form of an attack. So the Menezes Okamoto Vanstone attack on a decurve discrete log problem used pairings on, for example, super singular elliptic curves. So curves over FP, let's say, where the curve had P plus one points, have what's called embedding degree two. That is, they have a, they have a pairing which um, pairs points on the elliptic curve um, into and takes values in FP squared star. And they were able to suggest a, an attack on the, um, the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem, which basically just transfers the problem over to discrete log problem in FP squared star, which, as we mentioned in the beginning, we have sub-exponential attacks on the discrete log problem in, F, in, in FP star. So that, that was a very significant attack on super singular elliptic curves. It also just applies in general whenever you have a pairing um, that takes you into a group that's, that's too small to be secure. So another um, big breakthrough was in 2001, um, there may have been others that also came up with this same invention, but Bonnie Franklin introduced identity-based encryption using pairings. Um, and, uh, Antoine Zhu introduced a tripartite Tiffy helmet protocol using pairings. Um, and then, since then, as I said, the field has been really exploding. So there's so many, so many applications that I couldn't possibly list all the new protocols. Literally thousands of papers have been written in the last eight years on this. Um, so attribute-based encryption, um, uh, public key encryption with keyword search, predicate encryption, and I'd be happy to talk more about these applications with anyone if they're interested, but I'm not going to go into more details now. So one application that I wanted to give the details of, because it will be relevant for the um, network coding application that I'm going to talk about tomorrow, is a kind of a short signature application. Now, this is different from DSA, the, discrete, um, the uh, digital signature algorithm. This is this was a signature scheme proposed by Bone Lin and Chakam, and it uses the existence of a bilinear pairing. So when we say pairing, we mean a bilinear map pairing um, two elements from a group G1 and giving you an element of a group G2, and it should be linear in both factors. So with it now, this the signature scheme is. Given a secret x and a group element p, and also a hash function, you should be able to sign a message. So how do you sign the message? It's very simple. You, your public key is just uh, the usual public key, p and q, which is x times p. And you sign your message by just taking the hash of the message on into the, the group g1, and then doing the scalar multiplication x times that point, and that will be your signature s of m. And the verification will just be um, the rece receiver takes your public key q and takes a pairing of that with the hash of the received message. And that should match the pairing of p with your signature. And the reason for that is because of the bilinearity property. That this pairing of XP 
with h of m should be the same as x times the pairing of p with h of m, which is the same as the um, pairing of p with x times h of m. Okay, so, so far in all this pairing-based cryptography, the only pairings that we know to use are pairings on elliptic curves or Jacobians of hyperelliptic curves. There, people have investigated a few other directions. For example, I tried very hard for several years to investigate what's called the Castles Tate pairing on the Tate Shafarevich group of an elliptic curve. And there's there's more obstacles to, to doing that, to making that work, than, than I could possibly list here. So it just it, it, it was not a very good idea, and it's, it's something that has tremendous complexity involved. And as far as I know, no one has come up with any other ideas other than what we usually refer to as the Bay pairing or the Tate pairing on an elliptic or a hyperelliptic curve, or all of the generalizations of those pairings which take place still on elliptic curves and hyperelliptic curves. So whenever people talk about um, pairing-based cryptography, today that means they're automatically talking about elliptic curve-based cryptography, elliptic curve or hyperelliptic curve-based cryptography. Now that doesn't mean somebody won't come up with some efficiently computable pairing in the future, but nobody has any good ideas for that yet. Okay, so some of the generalizations of the Bay pairing and the Tate pairing that have been looked into are um, the square Bay and Tate pairings, and then um, later the eight pairing, the eta pairing, and generalized eta pairing, and all of these for hyperelliptic curves as well. So um, one of the uh, people who I was going to mention, who's done quite a bit of work on this, especially um, in the case of Jacobians of hyperelliptic curves, is um, Dr. Lee, who I think unfortunately could not be here tonight, but um, has written several several papers about this. And in fact, really the eta pairing um, is credited as being kind of a, a consequence of the ideas in this paper by George Mendeley. And tomorrow I'll give you some actual some implementation numbers for the comparisons between these different uh, pairings, and you'll see that it's really quite significant moving to these um, generalized eta pairings. Okay, so um, at this point I have two other optimizations of pairings that I wanted to go over, and uh, so perhaps what I can do is. Um, can I, can I take uh, an extra five or 10 minutes, or should I delay some of it for tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, so you tell me when to stop. <laughs> okay, so the way that pairings are computed on an elliptic curve, so if you want to compute the Bay pairing or the Tate pairing, so you take two points, uh, P and Q, which are M, they need to be M torsion points for some integer M. So typically what you'll do is, is you'll try to construct an elliptic curve with, say, prime order over a finite field. And that order should be M, or maybe a small cofactor you might want to allow, but you try not to lose uh, too much in the ratio between your group size and your field size. So you could think of M as being a large prime actually equal to the group order of the elliptic curve. So to pair two points, what you actually need to do is you need to um, find a function which has prescribed a divisor, prescribed set of zeros and poles, and then that function is going to be associated with the point P, and then you need to evaluate that function at Q. And if you're computing the Bay pairing, then you also do the reverse. You compute, you compute a function associated with the point Q, and then you evaluate it at the point P, and you take the ratio of these two things. Luckily, with the Tate pairing, you're able to get away with only doing it kind of in one direction. But Still, all the work in evaluating a pairing goes into constructing these functions um, that have these prescribed zeros and poles. 
So in general, if c is a positive integer, the function f sub c is going to be one which has a zero of order c at the point p, a simple pole at the point c times p, and a pole of order c minus 1 at infinity, and no other zeros or poles. So what you can see is if p is an m torsion point, then m times p is already 0. So this is really just a pole of order m at p. So the divisor of the function fm should just be m times p minus m times the identity, or the point at infinity, which I'm calling O here. So, but we need to compute fm recursively from these fc, where c varies from 1 up to m. So the way we do that, well, you compute f1, of course, and then you use, um, uh, I'll show you on the next slide what you do, but in the end, just want to mention that for example, for the tape pairing, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up evaluating this function that you've computed fm at two different points and taking the ratio. That's what will give you the final value of, oh, sorry, for the tape pairing, you're all, you'll also need to take a power of this value. For the vape pairing, you wouldn't need to. Okay, so how does the recursive step work? So you want to compute, if you know the function, um, fb and the point b times p and the function fc and the point c times p, then you want to compute the function fb plus c and fb minus c. So um, the way to do this is um, let g sub b c be the line through these two points and g sub b plus c be the vertical line through the sum. And so what you can show is, is that this function f b plus c can be computed recursively by just taking the product here and then multiplying by the quotient of these two lines. So you can see, much like in the elliptic curve scalar multiplication where when you did like a double and add step, you could kind of recursively see what you needed to do at each step. Here you can see that what you need to do is to multiply these functions together and multiply by this quotient of lines. So now we want to see what can we do to optimize or improve this, this op operation. Um, so for example, uh, when you, if you wanted to try to do the same trick that we did in the um, scalar multiplication case for the double and add. So um, I'm going to call this the parabola trick. This was also in the paper with Eisentrager and Montgomery. Um, and it allows you to compute this function, h2b plus c, was actually just the evaluation of f2b plus c. And it allows you to compute this directly um, only using the x-coordinate of bp plus cp and um, more efficiently. So to be, uh, f2b plus c, I'm just... Uh, using the formula from the previous slide twice here and just rewriting it. But the interesting observation, which I was actually going to try to draw a picture for you, is that this is the this part over here on the right-hand side, it can actually be replaced by the equation for a parabola. So right now, it looks like three lines, product of two lines divided by another line. But it can actually be replaced by a parabola, which allows you to compute it without computing the y-coordinate of the intermediate point, which was essentially the same trick that we used in the, um, in the double and add uh, idea. Okay, so this is basically the kind of second main idea that I wanted to get across in this talk is that um, you can replace this collection of lines uh, by a parabola through these points. And here is actually the, I didn't go through the derivation of it, but here's actually the equation of the parabola. So you can see that it requires only two multiplications. And these are slopes R and S, the same R and S from before that you would have computed already for doing your um, 
your addition of the elliptic curve points. So, and you do not need to compute y3 in order to do this. So, um, I think I won't push my luck and try to draw a picture on this. I think I'll just, uh, I'll leave you with the formula and I'd be happy to go over more, more questions uh, on this in person. So the final idea um, that I, this is my last slide that I just wanted to mention is that the idea of squared pairings. So this was actually in a paper in ANS 2004 with Eisentrager and Montgomery. Um, and it allows you to compute the pairing without computing a, another random point R. Oops, sorry, this is a typo. This is supposed to be R here. Um, computing a random point R and using this divisor can lead you to um, failure sometimes when, in, when you don't don't want it. So to make it deterministic, it's nice to get rid of that random R. And you can also get some denominator cancellation. And so basically, the, oops, I have another typo. The squared tape pairing can be computed very simply with this, this formula. And the only reason I mention this is because it should look very familiar to any of you that have seen the eta or the eight pairings. The idea of those pairings is that you're actually computing, they have a kind of a clever way to compute a power of the tape pairing. This is the square of the tape pairing. It will allow you to really improve the, the implementation of, of pairing-based cryptography. Um, not, not so much in this uh, squared pairings where we only got like a 20% improvement. But in the, you really see the improvement in the generalized eta pairings where they're literally able to um, double the speed of pairing evaluation compared to the tape pairing. So um, I think I'll stop with that and um, I'll take, be happy to take any questions. Thank you.